Commissioner Bas Commissioner Parrish? Here. Commissioner Mason? Here. Commissioner Jim Schaefer? Here. Commissioner Fox? Here. <clears throat> Alderman Stalchek? Here. Mayor Abendroth? Here. We have a quorum. First item is the approval of the December 7th minutes. We move to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 The minutes are approved. Move on to our consent agenda. And we have a request uh, to remove item three, the Ryan companies from the consent agenda. So I need a motion to remove that from our consent agenda. So moved. moved. Second. Motion and a second to remove. All those in favor say aye. 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 We'll take that item up after item number five. Item two is fresh, healthy eatery and juice bar conditional use grant. The applicant is seeking a conditional use grant approval to operate a restaurant, including a juice bar, at the property located at 11319 North Port Washington Road. That's the Sitco gas station. This is a public hearing, so I need a motion to go into public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion second to go into public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are now in public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to address the commission on this item? Seeing none. Move to close public hearing. Second. Second. Motion second to close public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Public hearing is now closed. We now move on to item four, <clears throat> Viridian Homes. The applicant is seeking open space plan and street tree plan approval for property located at 10729 to 10839 North Wauwatosa Road for the proposed enclave at Mequon Preserved Subdivision. And item five, <clears throat> Highlander Estates, the applicant is seeking development agreement for phase two Addition number one, and a fill permit in excess of 1,000 cubic yards uh, for phase two of Highlander Estates, consisting of 30 lots of the 111 lot single family subdivision located immediately south of Brighton Ridge and Knightsbridge subdivision between Swan and Wauwatosa Roads. That is our consent agenda, items two, Four and five. Does anyone wish to discuss any of these items? Commissioner Parrish. Uh, yeah, I had uh, two questions relating to the fresh, healthy eatery and juice bar. First of all, I was glad to see they're relocating or, or trying to. Uh, on the floor plan, it looked like the bathroom was right next, the gas station bas bathroom was right next to the food prep area. And just because it's on consent, I just wanted to make sure that was all kosher there. Well, the health department and the building inspection department will be involved in the remodeling, so if there's any issues, I'm sure they'll, they'll catch them. Okay. I mean, they're asking for <coughs> approval of it now. It just seemed odd. I assume all the duct work and all that sanitary. And then my other question was relating to the canopy, because we're requiring a canopy for this. Correct. There was some mechanicals put in place a number of years ago in the, with the former restaurateur, and uh, they never screened the mechanicals on top. So. They knew that as a conditional approval, they would be required to do so. Why, why don't they have to show us what it will look like and kind of more in color and the material? Well, there is a drawing in the... So the drawing. Yeah, they normally wouldn't even submit that ahead of time, but I ha they, they knew it was coming, so they did ask have an architect prepare the plan and draw it up, and our, our plan commission architect drew it up for them prior to the meeting just to... Okay. You were okay with it? I have to abstain on any discussion. <laughs> He's recusing himself. <laughs> I see what you so. mean. Okay. Yeah, so. But we'll work with them to get it. it right. we're no concerns from that end of it. So, okay. I've uh, no further concerns. Okay. I, I had a question. Um, is the restaurant going to be sit down or, or? There is a, a small area for two tables, so that it That's won't all? be a high volume restaurant. I had a question on whether it was adequate parking. If people are going to be there and stay, whether we. There's the guest parking, parking available, but with the the small volume, I don't anticipate it but being an issue. Mequon, Lawn care people have got part of that. Yes. So there weren't that many on the south side that I could say. I have just a question as to whether they meet our our requirements. Yes, we've looked at it, and based on the, it's again, it's a very small area, so I don't see any issue with parking. Okay. 
Any Any further discussion? Uh, healthy eatery and juice bar going to replace the Sitco gas station? No. No, it's, it's a very small portion inside the gas station. There was a, a former uh, tenant in there that served food and had there, so some of the equipment is already in place, but it's only going to take up a small portion of the C-Store that's there. I see. <clears throat> Any further discussion? We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda is approved. Move on now to item three, the Ryan Companies, the northeast corner of Port Washington, road and venture court, fill permit in excess of 1,000 cubic yards. The applicant is seeking a fill permit for 8,000 cubic yards for the construction of a three-story, 86,000 square foot medical office building uh, Port Washington and Venture Court. <clears throat> uh, yes, the uh, the applicant, as you stated, is is requesting the approval to to place 8,800 cubic yards on the property. Uh, the engineering department has has reviewed the the application, and we are recommending approval. Uh, we did um, include some staff recommendations. I think all of which are agreeable to the applicant, with the exception of number seven where we've prohibited hauling on Venture Court. Um, we feel it's important just because Venture Court is not built to the structural standards that Port Washington Road is, so the additional trunk, truck traffic gives us concerns. Uh, additionally, you know, we've had a uh, vocal resident who lives or owns and operates a business on the cul-de-sac who's approached us with his concerns. So we made the requirement uh, there is access on Port Washington Road, but the applicant would like to contest that. Great. Mr. Marks. Yes, thank you. And Jack, do you have those um, maps that we sent to you? Our, our major concern is that um, if we're not able to use Venture Court, all the trucks mainly leaving the site are going to be forced to drive north on Port Washington Road. Um, and we're assuming that those dump trucks are going to need to get back to the freeway system. So what's going to happen is they're going to either have to do a major U-turn on Port Washington Road to get back, or they're going to be driving through some of these Near, uh, residential neighborhoods, you can see some of the red lines and blue lines, or the green line that goes all the way up and around. Um, it, it, you know, it's I think a poor idea for uh, the city to have dump trucks driving through uh, neighborhoods <coughs> or doing U-turns. Venture Court, I, I don't know exactly the standards it was built to, but it certainly was built to handle truck traffic delivering to the pick and save store and some of the other. Uh, stores back there. Um, it is also a signalized intersection, which the others are not, are, are not so it will, um, you know, give us consistency in, in leaving the facility and office of safety making turns there. What is the Venture Court was initially, it was used for fuel truck turnaround. Um, when Port Washington Road was reconstructed, Venture Court was intended to be used so fuel trucks could turn around to get to the healthy juice bar <laughs> and the Sitco station. <clears throat> so it, it ought to be strong enough to handle a dump truck. And it it certainly is, you know, it was reconstructed, you are correct, it was it was reconstructed with Port Washington Road and, you know, it's it's at a minimum five and a half inches of asphalt. So. Compared to a regular driveway, it's a substantial pavement section, but we're just, if we can keep the trucks on the thicker pavement section roadways, we would do that, i.e. Port Washington Road or Mequon Road. So we, we shoot for that when we can. Um, if, if it is desired that uh, to allow them to haul on, on Venture Court, we would request that a, um, a road bond would be put in place to, to cover any of the damage. And in that case, we would then analyze the road ahead of time, uh, videotape it so that we could then um, analyze it after the construction to to see if there's been any damage done to the roadway. So that, that would be something we would we would want to do. That's what we normally do. Right. right. <clears throat> what is the purpose of 8,000 cubic yards of fill? You know, when people do construction with a lot of fill, uh, the commonest outcome is uh, diverting water onto adjacent properties by building the new one higher than everyone else. Right, and this, 
uh, to speak to the drainage point, there's an, there's an approved stormwater management plan for the site. It's been approved by the city. It hasn't yet gone to MMSD um, that accounts for the drainage on the site. So that's, that's been designed and it's been approved by us. So we, we do not feel that the neighbors will be um, adversely affected by the drainage. Um, now the, the fill that they'd be bringing to the site is the, the base aggregate for the parking lot. It's the, the backfill for the storm sewer. Um, sanitary sewer and water trenches. It's that type of fill. So it's it's an engineered fill. It's it's typically a stone material. It's not just you know dirt material. Okay, so it's not meant to elevate the no lot. Correct. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Alderman Strelchik. Um, I would just like to highlight the fact that the um, neighboring business did have some concerns with the drainage onto his property and during this process if this does receive approval it seems like it's got momentum to do so tonight that you take a little extra care to make sure that during that construction process during that fill process that we avoid the spillover into either the property of the east or the property of the north of um, your parcel that you're looking to add fill to I do know that uh, that roadway going in uh, to the Mickelson property the north does get a little soggy near the edges So when you're putting in your silt fences, just kind of watch make sure that the water can also get off that property in the in the method that it had in the past Yeah, we've had several um, Conversations with the Mickelsons. We've actually designed some features that we think are going to help quite a bit and uh, we've been able to sign some access agreements together and we have a good working relationship with the Mickelson so we'll be sure to do a nice job if we do make a motion to allow um, <coughs> truck traffic on Venture Court, is there a way that you could mitigate that slightly and, and, and request entrance off of Port Washington Road and exit with minimal traffic on Venture Court um, for the exits? Or is that just a logistical nightmare? Uh, so can you say that again? I didn't quite follow you. Staff's requesting that you have entrance and exit on Port Road. Again, if you cut that truck traffic in half and you require entrance on Port Road but allow exit on Venture Court to address your concerns, is that something that would be feasible with your building plan? Yeah, I think that could work just fine. Okay. Okay, I'm looking for a motion. <clears throat> I would make a motion to allow for exit on Venture Court only uh, with the fill traffic but still request that a clearly marked entrance on Port Washington Road um, to cut that truck traffic on Venture Court in half would be established. Second that. <clears throat> and you're willing to engage with a road bond and? Yeah, it's not our favorite, but I think uh, it's important for the city to, to do it this way, so. We do that with everybody. So friendly yeah. amendment on that. I'd also like to add a friendly amendment that per staff direction, there would be a road bond added to that to address the concern with Venture Court. Okay. Mr. Bessler, would you be willing to I'll second that? Accept the amendment. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve <clears throat> as requested by Mr. Marks. And seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion is approved. Great, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on to our regular agenda, the first item is Oldenburg Farm Conditional Use Grant. The applicant is seeking conditional use grant approval to allow for a commercial horse stable at the property located at 11446 North Farmdale Road. Uh, Mayor, there's a, a little video that the applicant has prepared, so I'll, I'll show the video. And, and I guess if there's, I know there's a number of audience members. I don't know if everybody has turned in their green cards that would like to speak. So maybe while the video is playing, if there's any additional cards we can take. I know, John, feel free to speak during the video. Uh, the initial the initial part of this video is just the interior shots of the stable facility just for information purposes um, it's a very fine uh, structure in every way the design is uh, is is certainly world class uh, we should have some exterior exterior for we shot these primarily to uh, for for future marketing and 
uh, because we're so proud of the, uh, the the appearance of this particular project. Can we do the, I can go to the outs and then there's the. This is an elevator. This is a shot uh, looking north on the property, uh, from from the barn. The uh, stable facility is now sw sw now swinging around to the east. Uh, th these are all aerial sh aerial shots that were taken uh, from a, pri a private concern that uh, does um, uh, the from a uh, um, what's what am I looking for here. Uh, a drone, a drone, right, a drone uh, so swinging around. This is again a shot looking to the north. We will swing around looking at the stable facility. Uh, this is the eastern part of the property and walking around uh, the facility to the north and we should swing around uh, and see the, uh, the property all the way in 360 degrees. The, the stable facility is, uh, has 18 stalls um, with a, a large indoor riding arena, uh, two, uh, two out, outdoor uh, areas. One is, uh, and we should get a shot of this, an outdoor riding arena that's been there and used for uh, about 15 years. Uh, there's individual turnouts for, for the, in the facility. This again is looking to the north. Um, and that is the, uh, that is look, that's looking due west uh, from the, the fields uh, and the wetland area is looking up the hill to the, to the west. So the request, I know there's two items back to back uh, and they're both part of the same property. The, the first request is for a conditional use grant for a uh, commercial horse stable. Uh, this is at 11446 North Farmdale Road. It's been a, a private horse facility for a number of years. Uh, the facility currently includes a 24,000 square foot stable and arena, a storage building, an outdoor practice area, and, and some paddocks. Um, the proposed use will include boarding, training, and riding events throughout the year. Uh, the proposed hours of operation would be from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. on the, during the week and 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekends. Um, in accordance with the zoning code, the, the applicant would be allowed up to 19 horses on the 20-acre piece. This will be split from the parent parcel. The, the proposed boundary line is the black line that's shown on the, on the screen, which encompasses roughly 20 acres. Uh, in terms of the conditional use grant, uh, we've gone and many have been here for the last uh, several horse barns that we've had, one on uh, Wasaki Road and one on O'Connell Lane. Uh, the, the removal of waste is always an issue. The applicant has agreed that waste will be removed on an, a, a weekly basis. There is an existing uh, dumpster area located adjacent to the storage building right here uh, that's pretty well screened from public view. Um, Again, uh, the closest residential property is about 520 feet to the south. Um, the rest of the land, as you'll see, was being proposed as a conservation subdivision. Um, there was a concern uh, by one of the neighbors regarding traffic. Uh, Farmdale Road is a local collector. Um, as James points out, it's roughly about 900 um, daily trips, which is uh, fairly low for that type of road. In comparison, uh, Freistadt and Highland Road see about twice the amount of traffic. So the engineering department is not concerned about the additional traffic created by the proposed use. Um, in addition to the borders, there'll be also smaller clinics and events. They state up to 30 spectators will be at these events. They have a, a adjacent parking on both sides of the building, roughly in this area here and this area here. Uh, that should be enough to accommodate uh, most of the uh, spectators that come to the events, there's also some grass parking that could be used in case of overflow. Um, again, staff is supportive of these. We've seen a number of these in the R10A. Uh, it promotes the rural and character of the area, and, and uh, we're supportive of the uh, of the project. I did an, add a number of conditions that we typically add for the uh, outdoor facilities, including the maximum 19 horses, the limits on the spectators. Uh, we also had a condition that uh, there'd be no more five than five trailers on site at any given time. I know that was a concern on O'Connell Lane. 
Um, but we do recommend approval according to the conditions in the report. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, this is a public hearing, so we need a motion to go into public hearing. So moved. Second. second. Motion and second to go into public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are now in public hearing. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on the item of a conditional use grant for the horse stable? The development will come up next. So, um, seeing none, uh, I'm going to turn the motion to close public hearing. So moved. Second. A motion second to close public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Commissioners? Commissioner Schaefer. Can we have, I assume this is, if you introduced yourself, I missed it. Can you, can you both yes. do so, please? My name is John Graham. I'm, I'm the part of the development team, yeah. and this is Karen McClay. Karen and her, her family will be the owners and operators of the, um, the horse riding, yes. stabling, training facility. Use the mic, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, uh, uh, my name is John Graham. I'll say it again. Uh, I'm, I'm the developer of this project, and um, Karen McClay and her daughter Kristen will be the owner operators of the um, riding training facility. Thank you. Nice to meet you. We have to talk about these two separately, yes? <coughs> yes. It's really hard for me yeah, to know. talk about yes. them separately. So if we were to vote hypothetically, if you approve the stable and not the subdivision, does the, does the, pro the commercial stable then go kaput? No, it's two separate applications okay. and two separate approvals. Okay. I mean, I. I have loved this property long before I lived in Mequon when we'd come up to get apples. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's phenomenal, and I would hate my understand. I have a friend who coaches eventing in the area, and my understanding is it's not being used um, for its intended purpose right now. It's maybe a little more storage and things that we've talked about before. But um, I would love to see it stay, and I love you know. I think you spoke about the rural character. I think it's I think it is beautiful. I would love to see that part stay. Um, but it's hard for me to talk about it without talking about the subdivision. So, you know, we've talked, as Jack mentioned, we've had a few horse stables in the last, I don't know, six to six to nine months that have come forward, and all the conditions I think that are laid out are seem reasonable. I don't know, you'll probably voice if you have any concerns or objections or you already have to Jack. Um, so I approve this portion and then I'm interested in talking about the subdivision. <laughs> I will a vote to approve this portion, and then the subdivision will be separate. Hello, Mr. Walter. Um, I just have a question. In the in the packet, you indicated that you were looking to have approximately 20 horses and potentially grow that. Um, staff has you at currently at 19 horses, um, based on the zoning. It's all based on the acreage that's allocated to the parcel. For the horses, so initially the plan was to hope to grow to 20 horses, but uh, I think that based on the land analysis, we are willing to live with a 19 horse limit. Okay, and that's. I just want to make sure that you've thought through the process with the acreage and the allocation accordingly. I like the fact that you're removing the waste, being that there's the wetland so close. Um, that's a really nice thing that that's included, and that you're uh, agreeing to do that. Um, do you have any other questions or concerns? I mean, just bring it forward. It, it is, a, you know, I'll, I'll mirror Commissioner Sch Schaefer's uh, sentiment. It's an exquisite property. Um, the integrity of this property is, is really a, a gorgeous piece as you drive by uh, going north on Farmdale, and, and I do want to maintain that integrity for the area, and I know that the area, when we talk about the rural character of Mequon, it, it embraces your entire surroundings. So. Um, I'm pleased to see that you're taking it back to its intended use with the horses. So I, I am supportive of this. Mr. Mason. Jack, from the horse stables that we've approved in the past, have there been any issues come back to us as far as the number of trailers, the the odor, the um, the number of participants, any issues that we've that have come up in the last six to nine months? I've had some complaints on the one on O'Connell Lane, which I think was somewhat anticipated over traffic in and out, but was we were unable to verify any. I mean, again, we knew it was going to be an issue, but there was a concern over 
the amount of trips in and out, and it was, it's, we haven't been able to verify that they've had any violations to the ordinance or to the conditional use grant. But other than that, no, I haven't heard anything on any of the other ones. Okay. Commissioner Schaefer? Can I just remind me that was the one that was at the end? At the end of a re residential subdivision, <laughs> yep. basically, yeah. yes. So a, a different situation. Yes, yes. Looking for a motion. I move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second <clears throat> to approve the conditional use grant for the Oldenburg Farm Stable. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The stable is approved. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll move on to uh, item seven, Oldenburg <laughs> Farm. Once again, a rezoning recommendation and a concept plan. The applicant is seeking rezoning recommendation and concept plan approval to allow for a 20 lot conservation subdivision located at 11446 North Farmdale Road. The development includes two separate sections of land. There's a 185 acre section on the east side of Farmdale Road and a 37 acre piece on the northwest corner of Mequon Road and Farmdale Road. Jack. Again, this is a request for a uh, rezoning and a concept plan approval for 20 lot conservation subdivision, 221 acres. Um, the conservation plan proposes approximately 71.7% open space and lots ranging from 1.25 to 3 acres in size. Uh, there are, again, as the mayor mentioned, there are two separate portions of land. The main section is in this area here, and then there's a small section uh, on the uh, north uh, west corner of Mequon Road in, in Farmdale. Um, as you know, the stable that we just uh, took action on, the 20 acres has been removed from the overall land area, so it's not being double counted in terms of the density. Uh, the remaining area is what we're looking at in terms of the density. I do have a yield plan on, on the screen here that'll show what the uh, subdivision would look like based on our current, current zoning requirements. This is uh, the five acre residential lot size. Um, this determines our yield for the entire site. As you can see, there's six lots shown down here while there's 14 up in here. That's different than the final concept plan. The developer basically took one of those lots that were located here and, and shifted it in this area. The overall density still remains the same, but there's only now five lots shown on this corner versus the uh, 15 up in this area here. Um, the, uh, the parcel to the east shows there's a significant um, amount of wetlands and wooded area. This is the Little Menominee River that runs through here. Uh, it's a you know, very wet area during the uh, summer months and spring, if many of you know that live in the area. Uh, there's a couple issues that have come up, and I've talked with a number of the neighbors about drainage, about floodplain. This area is in the floodplain, but based on our 2007 maps, it was not shown on any of the FEMA maps. That was due to some modeling errors that occurred at the time. Uh, they said they would get back to that when time has allowed. They are currently in the stages of um, doing the modeling. They have finished the preliminary modeling and has been sent to city staff, uh, both Milwaukee and, and Mequon. We've responded. They've responded with updated maps based on our comments. This is the uh, line that represents the final modeling that will ultimately go to DNR and um, FEMA for approval. So at this point, these aren't finished. These will have to be finished prior to uh, the development of the property to ensure that the uh, development is out of the floodplain. Um, I do have a contour map that I can show after I'm done with here to show kind of what that means in terms of elevations of those lots. Uh, there also hasn't been a wetland delineation done on the property. Uh, DNR won't uh, approve any wetland delineations that are done in the winter time, so we'll have to wait till spring until the snow goes away and the frost goes away uh, so that any preliminary plat that would have to come forward for this property would, would have to wait until that wetland delineation gets done. Ma majority of the wetlands are probably going to be in the area along the, the floodway and flood fringe and won't be impacted, but we just want to make sure that some of the area that they're looking at developing is, is you know, currently farmed wetland or something like that. We can't tell by just looking at the, the site conditions themselves. So, so those are two issues that we'll have to get addressed before the process goes any further. Um, as I stated, in terms of uh, open space, uh, the applicant is showing a 71% open space for the subdivision. Our typical conservation sub subdivision policy is roughly 60%, so they are exceeding that number. 
Uh, we've also had conversations with them to look at dedicating land to the city, and they are open to the idea. As many of you may know, this land down here is currently owned by MMSD. Uh, the Little Menominee Park, which the city owns, is up in this area. So what we're looking at doing is trying to acquire some land in this area to hopefully someday maybe have a walking trail that connects the two and maybe ultimately down to Lemke Park. There's a significant amount of uh, public land that's owned along that whole Menominee, Menominee corridor. So this would be another piece of the puzzle if we ever decide to go down that route. And the applicant has, is open to dedicating land. We haven't come up with a final location where that would be. Um, but we would do that prior to Common Council action on the rezoning, um, and we would continue working if this, this process goes forward. Uh, again, the, the plan has uh, a lot of the characteristics of our conservation subdivision design. There's open space along the perimeter, pedestrian trails, uh, pockets of open space. There are a couple rec minor recommendations that we are proposing. Number one would be uh, shifting lots 9 and 12 a little bit further south. They're up in this area here. We ask that those get shipped itself to provide a little bit more barrier on the north property line, and then add a trail linkage from the road to this trail through here. So those are two minor requests. Uh, I know engineering also had some requirements in there with regard to the, uh, the cul-de-sac at the, at the north end. Um, eventually, this may tie into Freistadt Road, so we're looking to see if we can get a road reservation and um, have dedicated right away to the property line. With 20 lots on a dead end road, it's not, you know, the the most uh, I think applicable circumstance for us. But we have other subdivisions that have 20 lots. Um, but if there is the opportunity in the future to connect, I think we'd like that opportunity to to take place and, and connect to Freistadt Road. The road also does basically get real tight to the property line to the uh, west. So we we look to see the right-of-way line come all the way up to that property line. That way, if there are a, a future development opportunities on this parcel, they could access that same roadway. Um, spoke with the applicant regarding both of those issues. They haven't had any issues with allowing those houses or that road connection to be shown on the final uh, preliminary and final plat. Um, again, in terms of lot layout, the 15 lots on the conservation piece average about 1.33 acres in size. The uh, lots along the uh, Mequon Road and, and uh, Farmdale Road down here are roughly uh, 2.75 acres in size, so a little bit larger. They also are shifted a little bit further to the north to maintain a, bar, a buffer from, uh, from Mequon Road. Um, other than that, I did have uh, Ken Baker, our forester, out on the site. There are some specimen trees, but they're mostly located in the wetlands or adjacent to the wetlands and should not be uh, impacted by any of the development on either two of the pieces. Um, that's all I have for now. I'm sure we'll have more conversation after the public hearing or uh, uh, once the public speaks. So I guess I'll wrap it up for there and say staff recommends approval according to the conditions in the report. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> Let me go to the applicant and see if you have any comments you want to make at this point. First of all, I'll introduce um, my my associate partner, Dennis Bush, Dennis has done m much of the development in the conservation subdivisions in Mequon. Um, and Dennis is a little bit um, under the weather and his voice is a little harsh, but if, if he has to talk, we can probably let him uh, get, get to it. So Dennis is involved as a, as, as a consultant to me uh, in, this, in this development. So we'll be available for, to respond to questions as well. Uh, the, the entire project has been designed around the guidelines established by uh, the Mequon zoning. We've been very careful to uh, minimize impacts. Uh, we intend to, to take advantage of the topography. All of the housing is, is well above the, the current floodplain levels, uh, and all, all of the lots are above the, the floodplain levels. And, the, the uh, home sites themselves are above those areas. So we have been careful. We've attempted to mi minimize uh, visual impacts. Uh, if you'll notice, the, the three lots that are in the, the upper section just before the right angle turn, uh, we had a cul-de-sac in that area prior to uh, the final design. We've now removed that cul-de-sac and have tried to pull the lots forward uh, away from that western property line. 
Um, beyond that, uh, we have uh, we have talked a little bit about trails that will run through the entire development to uh, accommodate the local residents. Uh, we have agreed in principle to uh, to uh, dedicate approximately uh, somewhere between 45 and 65 acres that would connect the the park to the north and the MMSD property to the south. Um, and I think that really covers it. Dennis, do you have anything to add to that? Um, <coughs> I'm delighted to be here tonight. Okay, <laughs> okay well, that's, uh, that's all you're going to get out of Dennis, but he, he can whisper in my ear Dennis if I need help. Well, he is a little horse, yes. Oh. So, um, uh -huh. yeah, beyond I'll that, Jack, I think. I've had the opportunity to do a good number of uh, conservation subdivisions in Mequon, and I, I think I have a sense for it. And uh, John and I spent a lot of time thinking about it and what would be most appropriate in the areas that have had the least amount of um, uh, impact on the environment. And so uh, with that, we move forward with this plan. And we did have the opportunity to talk to one or two of the neighbors, met with them for coffee, uh, specifically uh, the one directly to the west. And uh, I went, met him at his home, and we talked about various uh, options. And uh, based upon our conversations, this is what we have. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, we have a number of residents who have registered tonight. And I will go through uh, the sheets that I have. Gene Richmond is opposed. And it does not say if Jean wants to speak or not. If you want to speak, just raise your hand. Do you want to speak? Okay, thank you. Um, Dale Sheshow is opposed. Dale, do you wish to speak? <laughs> Come to the microphone. Dale, you know where to talk. Come on, buddy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I think you have my letter that I gave you. Um, I was the one that met with Dennis, but we didn't come to any understanding whatsoever <laughs> that he was talking about there with the coffee. But you guys have my letter. Um, one thing that I could mention as well, when you're talking about that path walking through the woods, I remember going through there as a kid. I mean, that's swampland that I was getting stuck in there in winter with a snowmobile. I can't imagine that people are going to want to walk through that swamp. But um, regardless of that, I'm not going to spend everybody's time up here. You guys have my letter. I think I made a lot of good points um, with that. Um, obviously, I'm opposed to it. What What's the main reason you're opposed? Well, uh, if you read my letter, the the main thing is the five acre, uh, which is the law in in, uh, in Mequon the way it is, is and uh, you're jumping all these houses to the the west side of the property, obviously because the other part is wet. <clears throat> and I said I've I've seen the areas underwater that I've, that I've told city staff that more than once have been underwater and, and flooded. I, there are going to be houses there. I imagine they're not going to be very happy when their houses are flooded out, specifically the properties to the south. And as you look at the map, uh, as the, uh, house, the three houses there jog to the east, uh, that area, there's a drainage part as well with a field that runs almost equal to the woods there that's been underwater more than once. I guess we'll have to wait for the study on that, but I wish I would have taken pictures, but it was, there were oceans of water out there at times, so there, it's definitely a wetland. Excuse me, can you speak closer to oh, the I'm mic? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm <clears> sorry. <throat> Which area are you referring to? Well, uh, both ends, is um, the south end, uh, you can see as the houses just start on the bottom end there, there's that the oh, one property to the south of me uh, that juts out to the east. Uh, there's water there. There's ponds there now. That's been underwater before. Uh, up towards the upper part where there aren't any houses uh, currently. 30 feet of 
has also been uh, underwater as well. Uh, below those three houses that were to the north end is what I'm referring to. Yeah, right there. So, so you're suggesting that some of the house, the lots be, for the homes <laughs> are actually underwater, <laughs> even though they're outside the floodplain? I am telling you that there has been standing water there. Okay. I wish Mr. I don't know if Mr. Brisky is here or not. I don't know if he's or not, but yeah, there has been standing water there. And on the other, as I mentioned, the northern property as well, the northern end there where it's, uh, uh, there's a significant low spot where it drains and that area is pretty much level with the woods. Uh, lost it. I do not like this. Neighbor. <clears throat> yeah, right at the bottom of the screen there, correct. where the pond is where the green space is uh, if you look where the property juts out to the east as you go uh, north there you see kind of a okay see that white rectangle on the left side of the screen follow that directly east and you can see a little bit of a abutment of trees there that's a low area that drains directly east I don't know if that's helping you or not but Yeah, I can. He's speaking in this area here. I'm assuming. I do have a, a a different map with contours on. I don't know if you want to see that now or if you want to wait till after the public's done. I can kind of show you what's out there in terms of our contours now. Okay. Okay. I I just wanted you to read my letter. I wasn't going to go up here and speak. Okay. <laughs> he called me up there, so. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dale. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, Gina Sakau is opposed. Does Gina wish to speak? Gino? No? Okay. <clears throat> Joe DeFrancis? Thank you, Mr. DeFrancis. Um, Dennis, can you respond to that? Well, we're going to try and maintain the current uses of the, the property that's there so that some of it was farmed and some of it wasn't farmed, and some of it was used as riding areas and stable areas, and we, are, we anticipate to maintain those 
in those uses. Now, some of them might become more of a, of a field to sort of a, a effect, but we're not planning to do anything significant in the way of a change. Okay. And, and those areas will still be, you know, 70% of, of 200 acres will be left uh, uh, unencumbered. And just for the commissioners that may not have been here since the last conservation subdivision, we typically require a stewardship plan for the open space areas where the applicant does provide what the open spaces will be used for and how they'll be maintained, and that gets passed along to the Homeowners Association once it's established. Okay, thank you. Um, Hermie Stern is opposed. Mr. Stern, do you wish to speak? No. Irene Myers is opposed and does not wish to speak. Kurt Shashau is Hope opposed. She's raising her hand. Do you mind change your mind? Can't hear you. Can you use the microphone? I think we should call her run up to the microphone because people at home can't hear the audience. Sorry. I'm just concerned where the water is going to come from. Where are these homes going to get the water from? And where is the sewer system going to go to? Now, if you build homes, obviously, uh, you're going to need water. And it's also going to be re um, released. And that's going to add to the floodplains, don't you think? Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, the, the property will de be developed with individual wells. And, That's correct. And individual septic. wells and approved septic systems, yes. Have you done perk tests on the property? Uh, we have not completed those as of yet um, uh, until this preliminary plan is approved. But we have, done, we have investigated soil, soil types, and all through Mequon, this is a very similar type of material. And this is all high land. There's nothing even close to the wetland areas uh, that where these lots are proposed. If my home on Farmdale Road is going to be sold, I will need to put in a mound system. So in other words, the property does not perk my property. So how can that property perk if it's a wetland? Well, you can't put a septic in a wetland, um, and they haven't done the perk test yet. So I guess that's probably the answer at this point. Um, Kurt Shashau is opposed but changed his mind and wishes to speak. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll speak. Uh, I was just looking at your plan there, and uh, the, the thing that intrigues me is you're, you're saying a lot of the outlot would be used for horses and, and everything. Um, that would probably keep the, the rural characteristics, but yet you're not adding it to the stable so you can increase <coughs> more lots, which in the end, if that is the, the purpose that you want to use that, that excess farmland for, then that should be attached to the stable and you should have less lots. Because looking at that many lots and, and all the, the surfaces that are going to flow down in there, you're going to flood the Little Menominee a little bit more. And uh, it's already backing up to the north as you go on the north side of Freyshet Road all the way up to Highland Road. So, I mean, you're just, you're just adding to the wetlands in the future. And... Um, as far as the, the horse usage, I mean, you, in one breath you're saying you'd like to have walking paths all the way through the woods and everything else, and then you want to use it for equestrian use and so on and so forth. The two aren't going to mix. I, I can guarantee you they aren't not going to mix. So that's all I really got to say. Thanks. <clears throat> Is this development, Jack, uh, James, um, have the same runoff requirements that any other subdivision would? Yes. So the, the runoff from the subdivided area would not increase over <coughs> what it is today in an undeveloped state. 
Correct. One of our requirements is for the stormwater management plan to be approved by both the city and MMSD. Uh, we haven't received the report yet, so we, we don't have much to comment on. Okay. Deanna Lee is opposed and does not wish to speak. Correct. Correct. Rudy and Brody Lang, opposed and does not wish to speak, correct? Pam Helmig, opposed and does not wish to speak. These people all live on Farmdale Road, by the way, except for Hermie Stern. Okay. And Gerhard Sheshow is opposed and does wish to speak. I live at 11915 Farmdale Road. In the year 2000, Mr. Oldenburg approached me if I wanted to sell some land. And I said I might. He said, it's only going to be used for my horses and pay hay, and I'll put a, a nice fence around it, which he did. Now, if you're going to put everything in uh, lots now, it's going to ruin the whole visit of Farmdale Road. Farmdale Road is about the last rural road we have left in Mequon. I like to keep it the way it is, and we've been uh, lifetime owners on their land. So I'm very much opposed to it. And I think uh, Mr. Old remembers that. He told me that he'd just use it for horses and grow grass. We don't want, need another subdivision there on Farmdale Road. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the council? <coughs> I'm sorry, the commission. Um, my name is Tom Zapchak, and I live at 11845 Sand Hill Circle, Mequon. And I guess I'm in the minority here because I'm in favor of the project. I think it meets all the criteria that the city has established for a conserv conservancy subdivision. We've got over 220 acres with 20 lots. If you do the math, it's way more than we need. And also, I have no personal vested interest in this property other than I am a developer. I'm the president of Lakeside Development Company. And I really have to say, we really need more buildable lots. This city right now, uh, we really don't have any uh, lots. There are some areas that we could be developing property on the sewer system. I understand that we have an issue with capacity in some areas. I think, I looked at this property, I actually walked the property with John Graham, and I think it's a beautiful site, but not only that, I'm estimating that this property will probably bring about $15 million to our tax base. And I, I realize you don't make a decision on economics, but in reality, I mean, it, uh, money helps pay for things, and we're going to have to pay for this uh, new source system, which I think is planned for 2017. So, and I, I believe me, I have empathy for the neighbors. Most of the people that oppose it are people that live in the neighborhood. But I think that if this city is going to continue to grow and increase the tax base, we're going to have to develop farmland and op open areas. So I support this project 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Just so everybody knows, oh. My name is Patty Ayer. We live on the corner of Farmdale and Heather, so we're just north of Freistadt Road, across from Barthel's Apple Orchard. Built our house 28 years ago, and one of the main reasons we moved to this area was the open green space. And we voted on the five-acre minimum some many years ago to preserve that green space. Why do we need to have more buildable lots on the west side of Mequon so it can be like the east side of Mequon and overtax the water base? 
leave it open and green, please. If you're going to do houses, stay to our five-acre minimum that we voted on and all agreed on, well, not all of us, but agreed on that it went into our local law. That's all I have to say. Please leave it green. Thank you. Um, just so everybody knows, uh, the Planning Commission will make a recommendation here tonight, and this will go to the Common Council, and there will be a public hearing in February, yes, in February, and uh, the second reading of the ordinance, the decision will be made by the Common Council in February, just so you know what's going to happen. Um, Jack, can you put the yield plan back up on the screen? Sure. Now, this is five acre zoning. This is what the landowner has every right to do to his property, just like you would have the right to do it to your property, would be to develop five acre lots such as you see here. Am I correct? Correct. And all they would need would be plat approval to build a subdivision in your neighborhood. Um, and I can certainly sympathize with the neighbors here. I mean, I've witnessed this happen throughout the city for the last 30 years. Undeveloped land gets developed for home sites and the nearby neighbors are not very happy about it. It happens all the time, no matter where it happens, this is what happens. The fact of the matter is though that the owner has the right to build this as long as they meet the rules and regulations of the city and the applicant has proposed a plan uh, that does that. So the decision, I, you know, it's impossible for us to say no to somebody that builds a five acre subdivision in your neighborhood at five acre lots and keeps the houses out of the wetland. It's impossible really to prevent that from happening. So the question is conservation design or not. Um, the city has encouraged conservation designs since it was incorporated 58 years ago. You know, some of you may remember Carl Wilbert and Ted Egelhoff and the people that started this city and they created a plan and the residential component of that plan was entirely based on conservation subdivisions. So this is not a new concept and you certainly have every right to oppose it but it's not a new concept. In fact, nearly all the subdivisions that have been built in the city since the 60s have um, been in one form or another a conservation style subdivision, nearly all of them. And conservation subdivisions have certain benefits, even to the neighborhood, they have certain benefits. So that's the decision <clears throat> that we're faced with here today whether we recommend this rezoning for a conservation subdivision. And what about the existing zoning though? I see part of it where the homes are it's zoned R1 with an agricultural overlay and then the other part is, is floodway where there aren't homes. So is it already zoned properly where the homes are going? Sure, the R1 district um, and the OA agricultural overlay, that basically occurs on every property that's over 10 acres in size. So you have the ability under the R1 to do the five acre. The OA allows you to do farming on it as well. Uh, the floodway is a zoning that you know limits obviously development in the area. And the lots that are shown up here, we require as part of the yield plan, the buildable area has to remain out of the floodway. But the rest of the parcel itself could be in the floodway. As long as there's a, an available upland, uh, they can have you know a, a, a building pad and then the rest of the land could be in the floodway. And I think one of the gentlemen asked about green space, and I think if you look at this design, you see that you'll have a lot larger lots. What You'll also have less control of what happens on those lots. And he talked about manicured lawns and things like that. Well, if you have the larger five-acre lots, it gives the opportunity for the owner to, the, to manicure those lawns. If it's left in open space for the subdivision, those could be left in more of a natural state. So the conservation design is, is meant for properties like this where you are abutting natural features, you know, significant topography, things like that, 
that we allow the development to only occur in the areas that are farthest away from the environmental areas. Now on this site, it's, it's such a, it's a tight site because of the way the parcel shaped and the way the, the river cuts through it that there isn't a whole lot of difference between the, the yield plan and the conservation plan, but the conservation plan does try to keep the property, keep the, the parcels, the homes outside the, the environmental areas as much as possible. Mr. Fox. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what's the price range of the homes you would expect to be built on these lots? Uh, we're going to set the minimum square footage at 2,400 square feet. Okay. And what would that typically valuation be? I don't know. You, you could build 2,400 square feet for $150 a square foot to $300 a square foot. I guess my feeling is that uh, the comment that was made toward the end there that we need more buildable lots I concur with, particularly lots that are unusual, <clears throat> which these uh, tend to be. Uh, we just lost some good friends to Holy Hill because they couldn't find a lot in Mequon that met their, their, their uh, expectation. And it was partly because there weren't lots like these available at the time. And so though I understand the idea that uh, many of you have grown up in an area, a rural area, with, with the type of uh, environment that, that you've had. Unfortunately, in liking, in, in liking to look at other people's property who is undeveloped, which is undeveloped, and that becomes more of the ambiance of the area. That doesn't mean individual property owners have the right to control how another property owner uses their property so long as they comply with the city ordinances and the zoning. You may want to, you may feel it would be nice if it could be, but that frankly isn't the way the city is organized. So having said that then, as the mayor is saying, if, if, if what's being proposed is something that's within the zoning and the ordinance, uh, it's something that we really need to pay attention to unless there's some particular objection uh, need to approve. Um, and I think this is a particularly attractive develop development it's a conservation development, but it's not some of the very small ones we've done on the west side, where they're really small lots, third of an acre lots. Uh, we've got lots that are of reasonable size here, with reasonable sized homes, potentially, probably greater than the 2,400 square feet. And we need to encourage that. We need more of that in Mequon, and less, in my opinion, of some of the smaller ones. Uh, because I think that's the nature, particularly the west side of Mequon. And we want to retain that as much as we can as we develop. Here's an opportunity to do that. And so I, I think from that standpoint, we've got to look very seriously at approving this particular development. Mr. Schaefer? Uh, given the fact that the owner has the right to subdivide it into five-acre lots, I much prefer the conservation subdivision. I think it's well-designed. And I think it's going to preserve the rural character more than five acre lots would. I especially like that green space that's going to be left natural. And uh, I, I really can't see any reason to oppose it. Thank you. Commissioner <clears throat> Mason. Jack, can you explain the difference between the red dotted line and the blue dotted line on the floodplain? Sure. In fact, I'll go to, I have another um, diagram that I, I because they both look to say the same thing. They're a 100-year floodplain right. as of December 2015. Uh, let me... I have another map here I'm trying to pull up. I'm not sure why it's not working. But um, the blue line is the 100-year um, floodplain line, which is our zone AE. The red line is a, a floodway line. These are both modeled lines that are part of the study that's underway. So the 100-year line is the blue line, and it deviates a little bit from here from the red line. The red line is the floodway line is typically the area when there is a flood event and water is flowing. That's basically how the water will flow, the path of the flowing water. The 100-year line will continue to carry water, but it will not necessarily be flowing in that area. It will be kind of standing water. Um, and that's totally based on elevation, that 100-year line. So the floodway line, is, it really, you can't see it when you're out there. You, there's no discernible, you know, visual 
mm. impact of it. It's just that it's a, a hydraulic modeling technique that shows where it's flowing. In terms of development regulations, the floodway is basically an area you can't do much of anything in. You can't fill in it, you can't develop in it, you can't put anything in it that's going to impede the flow of floodwaters. Uh, you could probably put in a parking lot, things like that. The 100-year floodplain, you can't actually develop in. You could, you could fill in that as long as you don't raise the flood elevation level, level by a hundredth of a foot. So you could fill in those areas, you could actually develop in those areas. And you can do other things within the 100-year floodplain as long as you meet the requirements set forth by uh, the DNR and FEMA. Now, they're not showing anything within that blue line as well. They're keeping it out of that blue line. And I do have another map to kind of, I'm not sure why it's not working. I'll try to bring it up again for you. But there's, I basically have overlaid that map on our contours and to, just to kind of give you a a overview of what that area looks like and obviously this is not working um, it's our new windows version so we're having issues with it but um, I will try to open it up again but basically this is here it is it's all elevation based and as you can see from when you overlay the contours with the uh, the blue line and the, the in this case it's all blue um, the flood elevation line, based on the modeling, looks like it's going to be right around 731 in that area. Um, and as you can see, well, you probably can't see because it's probably a little tight, but 731's here, and as, it, as we get away from it, it, it goes up dramatically. So the area where the development will occur, for the most part, ranges from 735, 740, up to, all the way up to about 7 you know, 65 in that area. So there's a tremendous increase in slope. And just for a matter of perspective, now water seeks its own level. So you have Glenwood Drive on the other side. The, the homes along Glenwood Drive are roughly around 732, 733. And the flood line, as you can see, at 730 comes right about to this area. So it doesn't actually hit the homes. It doesn't back up that far. So that 730, 731 line is a fairly accurate line in terms of representing where the flood areas will, will occur and have occurred. Um, so when we develop this property, the applicant will be looking at developing, in many cases, well above the 730 line. It would be more likely 735, 740. So in terms of distance, from a horizontal distance, it may not be that far away from a map, but from a vertical distance, it, it, it tremendously goes up, especially in, in the areas as you go, go further back. Now, the applicant, uh, one of the neighbors were talking about an area there's some standing water, and you can actually see it, it, it shows up on the topo. There's a little bit of a, a pocket here, like a hollow, and that's where the stormwater pan, pl pond shows up, because this area here doesn't really drain that well, and it would, it, when it does drain, it kind of flows through here. And this is, so this is where the stormwater pond shows up, and they have an outlet that comes through this area and then goes to the other pond. So it'll incorporate those issues, that current issue and the future issues, if any, occur through the drainage in that area. And there's also some low spots over in this area, too, as you can see, the contours basically disappear, which means it's a very flat area. But this area where the development is occurring is, again, a little higher in terms of the contours in, in this area. So I think overall, I mean, at this point, it, it's, it is close, again, from a, a horizontal standpoint, but vertically, there is, a, there is separation there in terms of the floodplain and whether these homes will be impacted by flood. Now, again, these are 100-year floods, so, you know, a 500-year flood or a 1,000-year flood may still cause some issues, but, you know, our, our uh, duty through the DNR and FEMA is to incorporate their regulations through the 100-year floodplain. And then as far as uh, perk testing, does every lot have to perk test? Do they have to do one for every lot, or is it just a general perk in that area? We usually get multiple tests per lot because at some point, you know, the house is going to have to go somewhere, and when they develop the lots, they don't actually know where the house is going. So they'll do multiple tests on each lot just in case the homeowner decides they want it in one location versus another. But there could be a situation where two lots would perk and then the one right next to it might not, and then... The next one may, and so what? so you might not get all the lots to perk that you have defined here. Is that true? Well, every lot we require to have a self-sufficient perk test on. And if they don't, then they don't get to develop that lot. I mean, we right. rarely run, rarely have. I don't think we've ever allowed a circumstance where you. Well, we don't. By ordinance, you cannot do a holding tank. 
we have allowed uh, one or two circumstances someone to use an outlot as their holding or as their mound system because the, the home location went in a certain spot when the owners wanted you know where and that's where the basically where it perked so we we have allowed you know outlots of the subdivision but it's very rare we typically don't do that unless there's no other alternative but if a lot doesn't perk we're, we don't allow holding tanks so that that lot just doesn't get developed or they have to look for another suitable location okay and then as far as um, water, they'll have to have a well. Is there, um, what's the water table like in this area? Uh, that I don't know. The, the well requirements are all through the DNR. We don't get involved in the, the well issue whatsoever. We just require them to get their wells approved through DNR when they build their homes. Okay. And then as far as the rezoning, we're saying that right now today, with the way it is zoned, they have the opportunity to build on if, if it equals the five acre lot, so then why is any rezoning requirement necessary? When we adopt our ordinance with regard to conservation subdivision, we required that that process be a PUD to go through this process. That's what the policymakers decided a number of years ago. So all of our conservation subdivisions have gone through the PUD process and have treated it as a rezoning. Some communities, they allow them as permitted uses. They don't allow them to go through that process, but as the Council made a decision years ago to require the PUD for all conservation subdivisions. Okay. Mr. Parrish? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna, one of my questions, Jack, will be where is the connector road? If you wouldn't mind pulling that map up. But um, just wanted to thank um, the applicant for the concept plan. Always appreciate it. Gives the neighbors a chance to also hear what you have to say. And, you obviously spent a good deal of due diligence with your, um, you even included a landscape plan, which I thought was particularly helpful. One of my comments was more landscaping along Mequon Road, uh, just as more of a, a buffer to preserve the character. Uh, but speaking of buffers, I think that's what I like most about it. Um, it is kind of at the entranceway of Mequon, so, you know, right now there is no water sewer, so it does lend itself well for this use. Uh, long term, I think it prevents uh, commercial development from trying to creep in there because uh, this is going to be a substantial investment in the area. I was concerned at first about the contours, but Jack just showed us that it wouldn't seem to affect um, some of the neighbors. Uh, Mr. DeFrancis's comment was really interesting about, um, you know, conservation subdivisions and, you know, versus having 20 individual lots, each with their own um, landscape plan so to speak so this would be our chance to weigh in on kind of like a conservation friendly uh, landscape plan that would really be native and i think that was a great suggestion and would encourage you to update your landscape plan um, with some of those native species uh, the wetland delineation, it, it seems it seemed a little bit early to come in before you had done a wetland delineation and now it's frozen and there's snow and it would just, you know, if we're gonna approve the lots, you, you know, you may have to come back. And that was one of my questions is, do you think there's a, a, a possibility they'd have to come back due to the results of the wetland delineation? Uh, it's hard to say, I don't think so. Um, but we do condition our rezoning approval based on the concept plan. And if the concept plan changes significantly, then they do have to come back for an amendment, basically another process. So um, it is the risk, but the risk is on them because if, it, if they, for some reason, there are wetlands out there and they cannot comply with this plan uh, substantially, then they have to come back and ask for an amended plan and basically amend the, the zoning. Yeah. If, if it weren't the weather, I probably would have preferred that, but given that we'd have to make them wait five months for anything Correct. to happen. Um, and then I guess the last question was about where the future roadway Are you, is. I'm not sure, what are you referring to? Maybe the north. Oh, to the north? For, yeah, for a future sub. I thought you had mentioned something. Oh, sure. Um, basically, I can, I'll try to zoom in, but it's been a little touchy. But up in here, there's a cul-de-sac. Um, and then we would do something at the end of that cul-de-sac where it would have a stub going to the property line. And so if north. the property ever to the north developed, then that stub would connect to that property and then ultimately to Freistadt Road. Okay. So that would give us a secondary connection into the subdivision. Thank you. So is that secondary con connection mandatory at the outset or is that a future well that's a re the, the engineering department is making it a recommendation of approval and would like to see it come in I guess the council and the Commission can 
weigh in on whether they feel that's appropriate. I know in the past we've had made them mandatory, and then when the future subdivision it gets developed, the current subdivision doesn't like it, and then sometimes they don't always connect. But uh, it's uh, it's for safety, for public safety, for redundancy. We always prefer at least more than one exit is usually not enough. We prefer two and sometimes more. In this case, there's really not a, a way to get another road in there at this time. So we're hoping that if the future development comes forward, that we can add that connection and get the right price step road. But that land could remain agricultural for the next 150 sure. years. Yes, it could. It never developed. Because nobody's going to force anybody off their agricultural land. No. Um, Jack, can you highlight for me what the actual density is of this development? Because well, we, we're talking about lot sizes, and I heard a couple of the residents come forward, and they don't like the smaller lots. And then when you're dealing with a yield plan and a conservation development, I just I really want it kind of spelled out clearly exactly how many homes per acreage we're looking at. Well, I mean, at the 20 lots and 185, you're close to eight, nine acres, if I'm doing the math correctly, per unit now. Now that maybe isn't a true identification because there's a lot of floodway and wetlands that couldn't be developed anywhere, but we're far in exceedance of the one lot per five acres that the code requires. Okay, I, I just wanted to make that clear to the residents that are here with concerns about too many lots in a smaller area or smaller lots. Um, I really, tend to like conservation subdivisions. As you look at the yield plan, and if you force the issue and you suggested that they build five acre lots, I think a lot of your concerns as you're coming forward with additional lots, people putting in lawns, people watering those lawns, uh, those lots are now getting closer to the property line to get yield plans and to get to the maximum yield out of the property. What I like is with a conservation subdivision, the surrounding residents that are concerned about it actually have a little stronger buffer. They're looking at more of the traditional green space that they're used to looking at all along. I believe that if we are going to proceed with development or if this does get approval, that that is the best plan for this site. Um, you know, the gentleman that's that's got the native species in his yard, um, I've got a resident in my district as well that, that he's devoted and dedicated to it and he's spent countless hours. Um, taking out the invasive species in his land. And he absolutely loves the fact that he's restored his land, he's won awards for it and things like that. Um, this gentleman's you know, done a really nice job. He has similar concerns with neighboring parcels. Um, as you have a conservation subdivision with those bigger buffers, with the homes a little more clustered, I think you end up with a little bit more of that rural character that you're wishing to maintain. Um, so I do have, I wish a couple more of you would have maybe come forward and spoken. Maybe you can do that at council um, if you do have additional concerns on that. Um, I've heard consistent objections to drainage. Uh, when Lumen Christie came forward with their plan, they were at the break-even drainage. Nothing else was going off the land versus uh, prior to development or prior to their proposal versus what they came back with. They went back to the drawing board, they adjusted their plan, and they actually improved the drainage. It's not, legally, it's not the burden to do more than the minimum, but what I would encourage the applicant to do is do whatever you can to mitigate some of that drainage. If you can look into a permeable surface for that access road, that is actually a permeable surface where that drainage would be mitigated if you can make those ponds a little bit larger without a huge fiscal impact to your project please do so to address some of the neighbor's concerns. I do like it when um, plans come forward and it shows that you have taken a lot of what you're hearing in the room forward and you brought that forth to a plan without destroying your opportunity with the project while maintaining the quality and integrity of what Mac one has set forward. Um, I think that's about it, so thank you. I have a lot of notes here. Let me, I'm trying to get my thoughts organized. One quick clarification first. <clears throat> this caught my eye when I was reading the packet over the weekend. You mentioned the entrance will be like Hawks Landing. 
and, and I think then I translated in my head. So it, from what you said, we aren't expecting this to be another Hawks Landing type subdivision with that, um, that level of, of homes, because that's a pretty high price point. Is that true? 2,400 square feet smaller than probably most of the Hawks Landing. Mm, 2,400, excuse me, 2,400 square feet will be the minimum, yes. Okay. But <clears throat> I, I think uh, Mequon does not have a lot of lots which uh, would be a nice platform for larger homes. And I think this would be a fabulous opportunity for those homes here. So you do have some vision that it might be, that that's not a bad comparison, a Hawks oh, Landing-ish. I, I did Hawks Landing. I, I feel this property is as nice as Hawks Landing, yes. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, so the owner has the right to develop this. We've established that, and clearly mm -hmm. it seems to be an economic decision on the, the owner's part because it's a you know, value proposition here. And I'm thankful to the mayor for clarifying uh, <laughs> what we can and what we are voting on um, so that I can bear with me. I'm gonna go through my opinion even though it's, um, and I'm gonna have to figure out how to phrase my vote because I'm strongly opposed to this um, for a few reasons. I definitely, agree with most of the points that the residents brought up. I think that um, the letter that was put forward is something that I probably would have written myself regarding the rural character of Bequan. And I don't know exactly where we intend to draw that line for rural versus versus commercial or versus develop, development, but it, you know, without having a hard and fast line, this to me is on the rural side of the line. It's very, it's such a, such a pristine area and it's hard for me to picture it being developed. Um, I'm not a developer. I feel that we have a lot of buildable lots, and, and perhaps these are unique, but I would imagine if you talk to other developers in some of the half-finished or mostly unsold um, <laughs> lots in subdivisions along Highland, along Mequon Road, on the west part of, of Mequon Road, I would imagine they thought that their developments were also unique, and yet there we sit, you know, here we sit with many empty lots for sale in those areas. So I struggle with that a little bit, um, or, or more than a little bit, I guess. Um, and yet, we, you know, here we sit with this zoning and the ability to, for under the existing zoning, the ability for this property owner to, um, you know, build out on the buildable land five acres minimum. So I think that's all been hashed out. What I need, perhaps, staff to help me with is, I think um, Commissioner Paris mentioned, you know, the concern about kind of the water and not having sort of final details around that. Is there any reason or any way we could table this until we have that? Because I do think it's a, I mean, from what I see and, and from my limited, I'm not a neighbor, but I have tried to walk on the Little Menominee River Parkway, the part that comes off Rystadt, and I've never successfully done it because it's always been wet, even in seasons when you would not expect it to be. So that's a fairly major concern for me from a, you know, more of a peripheral um, observer. I feel concerned that what we're seeing and what will come back after we have the final details is probably quite different. Is there, I think I'm in the minority, but I just want to no, see I if think I, can I think that. I appreciate the concern and I think it, and I've had that conversation with a number of the landowners around there as well, is like why are we rushing this, base, so to speak? And, and I think part of it is number one, that this is the concept plan and rezoning. So this gives them some vested right into the property. So that allows them to go forward and continue to spend money developing it, knowing that you know, there is a, this plan has been approved. It doesn't mean they can start construction tomorrow. So that is where I think we want to draw the line a little bit in terms of you're not allowed to get preliminary plat until some of the things get ironed out because that allows them to actually develop the lots as approved. This is just a concept plan. So if it comes back that something dramatically changes, that doesn't mean they can still build this plan as is. They're going to have to modify the plan. So it does give them a little bit of rights, but it does protect our our you know our future approvals of it we're not obligated to to approve this plan unless it's shown that they can do this plan without violating any requirements and i guess the other concern that i understand is regarding the floodplain that line may change but it's not going to change dramatically i mean even the even some of the recommendations or the the changes that we made that altered that line we did some work on freistat road with regards to a culvert things like that these uh, the elevation changes were in the hundredths of a foot to tenths of a foot. So, what's the I, setback, Jack? What's that? What's the wetland setback? 
in this case, probably 50 feet roughly, I would say, 50 to 75 feet, depending on the quality of the wetland and if it's in a corridor or not. But the wetland area from basically what's, uh, what I'm seeing from the DNR's website, because they do show some of it as wetlands, but we just use that as a, a guide to know that there's wetlands there. It's all, all within the wooded area. They don't show anything outside that wooded area. So it, you know, unless again, there's, we, we do end up getting fooled sometimes with hydric soils that are being farmed that don't show up until you actually go out there and test them. But again, if that's the case and they come back and all of a sudden the wetlands are encroaching well within the developable area, then again, they're gonna have to come back in front of you and modify their plan. So we do have some protection uh, with regard to that, but this gives them the right to go forward and knowing that you feel either in approval of this or in disapproval of this in terms of going forward. So hopefully that can kind of help you a little bit I mean, understand. It's, it's only in approval of the con the con conservation subdivision versus leaving it at is and as being an able to develop design. five acres on whatever the sure. buildable lot is. So maybe a probably a greater yield actually. Um, I don't know, I just struggle. Just because we can develop something doesn't always mean we should, and that's no offense to you. I'm sure you do a phenomenal job. We have some lovely conservancy subdivisions in Mequon. I live in one. I like it. Um, and I guess, I, you know, if you talk to kind of about the history and how we got here, I guess, it, I don't I wasn't here at the time, but from reading a lot of the old reports, you know, back in the early or late 90s, early 2000s, they had this big discussion about policy. And they could have gone a number of different ways. I mean, there are communities that have a1 and A2 ag zoning categories, which allow houses at 1 to 10 acres or 1 to 35 acres. Uh, you know, the council struggled with what to do. Some even thought three acres should be allowed in certain areas, but then five acres west of the Little Menominee. Um, or they could have went to the 10 acre and 35 acre ag zoning. And, and basically the, the solution was allow the five acres, but allow them to continue to farm it and have agriculture oper operations as kind of a, a you know, a, a in between, yeah. yes. So that's how we kind of ended up here. Um, and then with regard to lots, I, you know, I, again, it's, we're doing a zoning change. It's not really re relevant to how many other lots are out there, but we have seen a dwindling of supply in lots. In fact, I think over the years, the conservation lots have done better than the five acre lots. I think uh, the last two five acre ones that I can recall were um, up on Farmdale and Highland, um, Highgate, and that one struggled for a number of years of, with lots, and that was a five acre design. And then there's a Majestic Meadows that was up on uh, Bonniewell and Wasaki, and I don't think they've had any homes go in there as yet, and I don't think you probably even know where that one is. But So the conservation design has been, you know, well recepted in the marketplace. Um, and it's it's shown to be a, a good model going forward. Now again, I I don't understand we're we're still eliminating farmland, but they have that right. So we're trying to make the best design possible with the with the uh, tools that we have in front of us, basically. Okay, thank you for for clarifying. So essentially, if I vote no, I'm just voting no against the conservancy, or the conservation conservation subject. design, correct? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you put that in the minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Over here. Commissioner Bessley. Uh, Jack, is that string of houses snaking in between wetlands on both sides? Um, when you, uh, you're saying onto the east and to the west, or? No, I don't believe there's any any wetlands to the west. The wetland area will be down in the Little Menominee. Um, this area is all upland and it drains. Now there may be pockets in there of some, but I, there, nothing shows up on the sewer pack or DNR inventory uh, that we haven't. You know, we'll we'll know finally once they do the delineation. But um, there's nothing shown on there at this time. I thought one of the residents commented that. There was standing water on the left of the of that developed area. There is uh, an existing pond out in that area right now. That's up in this, but that's to the east of of the lots on the on the north end. So to the left of the de of, of the string of homes, there are no wetlands. There are no. I'm not aware of anything and nothing shows up in the inventory at this time. Again, there's a low spot kind of in this area here that drains, but you know, in order to be considered a wetland, it has to meet certain characteristics, including hydric soils, and that will be determined 
once they do their delineation. But nothing shows up at this time that that's a, a classified as a, a wetland. Well, Jack, if you've got some dips where you get collection of water, isn't that correctable by the builder in terms of some grading? To sure. Well, water? that's actually where his stormwater pond's going. So he's going to take advantage of the existing okay. topography to put a stormwater pond there, which makes sense. <clears throat> Yeah, ponding of water after it rains doesn't denote a wetland. Right. Um, not necessarily, anyway. Commissioner Felcher. Right. I think what Commis Commissioner Bessler was asking as well as, you know, what we want to make sure as a commission here while we're looking at this plan and we're looking at the conservation, that the drainage from the west to the east isn't being encumbered by the subdivision. So I would just like some assurance that based on everything that we're seeing here and as plans would potentially come forward, that that drainage isn't going to be encumbering the western property owners and this would cleanly drain from west to east into the Menominee River naturally. Sure, I think we'll do our, our due diligence with every subdivision in terms of engineering requirements and make sure that they, they comply. And the current plan as you're seeing it is not encumbering anything that we see here? Even though it's concept plan, they do kind of take in consideration the topography out there. Like I said, there's that pond that's located here, and it also has an outfall that then goes between the two existing lots to another pond back here. So that kind of follows the natural drainage in this area. And then up in here, there's an open space that allow drainage to come through as well. I mean, these, these lots are significantly higher over here than, than these uh, ones that are proposed. Some of these are 20 to, the homes are 20 to 30 feet higher in this area here, and it all is flowing either east or southeast and they've they've taken that into consideration but as they continue to move forward with full plans and engineering plans we'll make sure that that condition gets uh, any conditions will get addressed in terms of the drainage i think that's going to be a critical issue to the residents and you know please call that out on all the future reports if this does pass tonight thank you you would think that uh, farmdale road is higher than the whatever you're calling this road uh, where the houses go. So yeah, Farmdale's about 800 at the, I think at the peak, and this road will be more than probably in the 750 range or so. Yeah, so, so the water's not going to back up to the west. No. Uh, if they do something wrong, the houses in the, the subdivision are going to be the ones that suffer. Sure. So, and they're probably aware of that. I think we are. It's just important to have it noted in the minutes that it was addressed. I just want to comment on rural character. Um, when I go on vacation, I go far away from everything. To me, that's rural character, like central Nevada. Um, <clears throat> but rural character here in Mequon, what does that mean to people? Um, sometimes it means dairy cows and cow corn, um, but we can't really legislate that. So. What we have tried to do and what we have done is rural character, the rural area of the city means five acre density for residential housing. And that's kind of the, the policy we've set. And, and that can be five acre lots or it could be two acre lots with three acres of uh, open space. And what makes it look more rural to you or to you or to me is subjective. Um, we tried, as Jack said, uh, back in the 90s to incorporate 35 acre zoning in the city, um, which would have eliminated projects like this entirely. Um, but there was a lot of pushback, primarily from the agricultural community. They didn't want their lands zoned at 35 acre minimums. So I went to five acres and the five acre is what the professional engineers, et cetera, will tell us. You don't need um, urban infrastructure. You don't need sewer and water. You can accommodate that kind of development with septic systems and with wells. So that's why we set up that five acre minimum. It was politically at the time, it was the best um, solution that we could come to to preserve the lowest density that we could. Mr. Schaefer. Can I do one more quick question? I think Alderman Strelchek 
tried to get to this, and I'm sorry if I missed the answer. So if we if we went with the five if the five acres sort of as is zoning is the answer that we don't know how many lots that would yield based on what we assume is kind of the buildable portion. You said you said two, so you said it was like 185. Well, they, the yield acres. plan is basically we we as in a way to determine density, we require them to do the yield plan. Yeah. So the yield plan shows what the subdivision would look like potentially. Um, based on our current zoning. Now, the, different, the only difference between the yield plan and the, uh, the concept plan is that they just shifted one lot basically from the piece on the corner to the, uh, to the main parcel. So it's still the same number. The same total number, correct. Now, again, they made, if we don't require the yield plan to be something that is 100% realistic to development, they may, if, if the conservation design is denied, they may go back and look at it and say, well, this is not how we want to develop and, and it may change and they may reduce the lots by one or two. It's, it's hard to say, but this is what we use as the benchmark to determine density for every project that we've been doing ever since we've had the conservation subdivision requirements. Thank you. Excuse me, I have a question for uh, you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Did you say that uh, the motivation for the five acre minimum was to assure that a house would have uh, adequate access to water and uh, a septic system? Well, not necessarily to provide that it has adequate access, but that is the minimum size, the smallest size you can go and not require urban services. So with five acre density, you don't need sewer and water, you don't need four lane roads, et cetera. One acre density, two acre density, you do. Okay. And by doing this design where uh, the house is really on an acre or two, mm -hmm. and there's a uh, an attribution of an extra four or three acres to that one or two acres that's that is built. Uh, that combination still meets this five acre criterion. That's the theory. The carrying capacity of the land, the ability of the land to absorb a certain amount of development at one unit per five acres, which this is an example, one unit, actually one unit per nine acres. Um, but yeah, Thank by you. providing that land, whether it's you own it or you all own it, as you know, um, it, it, according to engineering, it, that provides the capabilities. Thanks for the explanation. Anybody want to make a motion? Sure. Commissioner Mason. I just had a question for the applicants. Are you in agreement with um, everything that's been put in the staff report, the recommendations, requirements? Do you understand those and, and um, agree to those? Yes, sir. We, we were part of the negotiations, and we agree with what's been written. Um, we have no argument at this point uh, with anything that's been said tonight. Okay, I move to approve um, this development as recommended by staff. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. It's not really approving the development, it's, it's <coughs> the two zoning the rezoning rezoning and, and concept plan. Yeah, we're recommending rezoning to uh, the planned unit development, and we're uh, recommending the concept plan that has been presented to us showing the conservation subdivision. And as I said, this will go to the Common Council for a public hearing in February. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Commissioner Fox? Yes. Commissioner Bessler? Yes. Commissioner Mason? Aye. Commissioner Jim Schaefer? Aye. Commissioner Parrish? Aye. Commissioner Becky Schaefer? No. Alderman Strahlcheck? Aye. Mayor Avendroth? Aye. Motion passes seven to one. Seven to one motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Um, 
Next item is announcements, and the next meeting is February 8th, Monday, February 8th. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned.